Um, welcome to the session, Demystifying CDKs in Breast Cancer Beyond CDK46. My name is Renat Jesselson, and I'm a breast oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I'm very pleased to moderate this session since we have three outstanding speakers who will talk about a very timely topic of both resistance to approved CDK46 inhibitors and the development of novel CDK inhibitors. So the first speaker is Dr. Ariella Henker. Um, she is an assistant professor at UT Southwestern Medical Center. She did her PhD in genetics and molecular biology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she trained in Dr. Channing's lab. She then pursued a postdoctoral training in the laboratory of Dr. Carlos Artiega at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She joined the faculty at UT Southwestern in Med um, Medical Center in 2018, where her work is focused on therapeutic targeting of breast cancer-associated alterations and delineating mechanisms of resistance to breast cancer-targeted therapies. The title of her presentation is CDK46 Inhibitor Resistance, Biological Mechanisms and Novel Approaches. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jesselson, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to present in this exciting forum. Uh, here are my disclosures. So CDK46 inhibitors, in combination with endocrine therapy, have revolutionized the treatment of metastatic ER-positive breast cancer, which will be the focus of my talk today. And you can see here that um, the addition of all three approved CDK46 inhibitors, popocyclib, ribocyclib, or abemocyclib, to endocrine therapy prolongs progression-free survival to a similar degree. However, uh, resistance um, often occurs and ER-positive metastatic breast cancer remains a lethal disease. These combinations are rarely curative. So therefore, it is imperative to identify uh, novel therapeutic strategies to prevent or overcome this resistance. So CDK4 or 6 in complex with cyclin D1 phosphorylates RB, allowing release of the E2F transcription factor and cell cycle progression from the G1 to S phase. CDK4-6 inhibitors prevent this phosphorylation of RB so that RB sequesters E2F and uh, this uh, blocks cell cycle progression. Now, cyclin D1 is actually a transcriptional target of the estrogen receptor and a major mediator, mediator of estrogen-dependent growth. In addition, cyclin D1 is a transcriptional target of growth factor signaling pathways that are commonly activated in ER-positive breast cancer cells. So this might help to explain why ER-positive breast cancers are particularly sensitive to CDK4-6 inhibition. Uh, so unlike many uh, kinase targets, on-target mutations in CDK4 or CDK6 that block drug binding have not been found in resistant tumors. Instead, components of cell cycle machinery, such as RB1, cyclin E, or CDK6, can be uh, deregulated to allow cancer cells to escape CDK4-6 inhibition. So for example, if RB1 is lost, um, then CDK4-6 inhibitors can no longer uh, block the E2F transcription factor and um, E2F transcription remains on and cell cycle progression remains on. Um, in addition, growth factor signaling pathways have been shown to promote resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors. Now, due to time constraints, um, I will focus today on genomic alterations that are drivers of CDK4-6 inhibitors that have been identified in patients. Um, but I, I do want to mention that there are other non-genomic mediators of resistance, um, including epigene epigenetic and microenvironmental mechanisms of resistance. So one of the best known um, alterations that drives resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors it are loss of function alterations in RB1. And I just showed you that if you lose RB1, uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors can no longer block E2F and they can't block the G1S transition. Um, so this is data from the uh, circulating tumor DNA profiling from the Paloma 3 trial 
showing an enrichment in loss of function RB1 mutations that were acquired um, in patients following progression on polypocyclob plus fulvestrant, but not fulvestrant alone. In addition, CRISPR-mediated knockout of RB1 uh, significantly shifts the uh, IC50 curve to all three CDK4-6 inhibitors and in ER-positive breast cancer cell lines. So loss of RB occurs in about 10% of patients that progress on CDK4-6 inhibitors. And it's important to identify therapeutic strategies for this patient population. Um, so loss of RB uh, seems to enhance dependency on components of the G2M and spindle assembly checkpoints. So for example, um, loss of RB has been shown to be synthetic lethal with aurora kinase inhibition in certain tumor types with RB1 loss of function mutations. Specifically in breast cancer cells, Dave Cheskin's lab recently showed that uh, loss of RB is associated with mitotic defects and confers sensitivity to the spindle assembly checkpoint kinase, TTK. So um, since this is a rising patient population, there really is an urgent need to push forward novel therapeutic strategies, specifically for ER-positive RB1-deficient breast cancers. Overexpression or amplification of cyclin E1 and cyclin E2 are also associated with resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors. So cyclin E in complex with CDK2 can bypass CDK4-6 inhibitors uh, by um, phosphorylating RB even when CDK4-6 um, is blocked, and, and this would lead to uh, the G1S transition and um, activity of E2F. So because cyclin E um, partners with CDK2, tumors with amplification of cyclin E may be particularly vulnerable to CDK2 inhibitors, which Dr. Chandra Lapati will talk about next. In addition, um, a, a preclinical model of cells overexpressing cyclin E2 uh, were shown to be sensitive to CHECK1 inhibitors, which are currently in clinical development. Also, multiple mechanisms of resistance converge on CDK6, and this can be amplification of CDK6 or uh, loss of FAT1 or other components of the HIPPO signaling pathway, um, which then activates the YAPTAS transcription factor, um, which leads to transcriptional upregulation of CDK6. In addition, loss of ARID1A and P10 also induces CDK6 expression. So why would this elevated CDK6 not be blocked by CDK4-6 inhibitors? Uh, Dr. Chandra Lapati's lab showed that when CDK6 is in complex with cyclin E and the INC4 tumor suppressors, this actually occludes the binding of CDK4-6 inhibitors, so they can't bind as well. Um, so preclinical models overexpressing CDK6 were resistant to CDK4-6 inhibitors, but sensitive to CDK6 degradation with a PROTAC. Uh, next, growth factor signaling pathways promote resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors as well. Um, a kinome-wide ORF screen done in the Arteaga lab showed that uh, overexpression of FGFR1 confers resistance to fulvestrant and ribocyclob, and FGFR1 is commonly amplified in ER-positive breast cancers. Uh, so a PDX with an FGFR1 amplification was sensitive to the combination of fulvestrant, a CDK4-6 inhibitor, and an FGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor. In addition, HER2 can promote resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors. Uh, Nick Wagley's group showed that uh, activating mutations in HER2, which are found in about 5% of endocrine-resistant metastatic breast cancers, promote resistance either to fulvestrant or pavocyclob. And the SUMMIT trial recently showed that the combination of HER2 inhibitors, neratinib and trastuzumab, and fulvestrant was effective in um, ER-positive HER2 mutant breast cancer patients who had progressed on CDK4-6 inhibitors. Loss of P10 can also promote resistance, and this can be overcome by the combination of a CDK4-6 inhibitor and an AKT inhibitor. 
So um, to summarize this part, um, I've shown you that there are several different um, alterations in cell cycle, um, proteins that can confer resistance, and also growth factor signaling pathways. And I think going forward, it will be important to um, do further preclinical work to examine combinations of some of these um, biomarker-defined therapeutic strategies that I discussed uh, together with CDK4-6 inhibitors and or SIRDs to identify which combinations will be most effective without sacrificing tolerability. So one problem we've had in the lab is that laboratory models of CDK4-6 inhibitor resistance that reflect the heterogeneity seen in patients are really lacking. Um, so to overcome this, what we've done is um, we've taken metastatic biopsies from ER-positive breast cancer patients progressing on CDK4-6 inhibitors. And we digested the tissue and uh, resuspended them in 3D matrigel domes to establish patient-derived organoid cultures. Thus far, we've established about 14 patient-derived organoid lines from CDK4-6 inhibitor-resistant biopsies with about a 50% success rate. We've characterized these patient-derived organoids with respect to uh, sensitivity to CDK4-6 inhibitors, and almost all of the organoids derived from the uh, resistant tumors retained resistance in vitro. Also, with respect um, to IHC and HNE, um, comparing the biopsy to the organoid. We also did genomic profiling of the matched biopsy and the organoid, and we found that in the vast majority of cases, the genomic alterations that were found in the biopsy were retained in the organoid. Finally, um, we found that uh, our collection of organoids um, has a pretty good representation of genomic alterations that are associated with CDK4-6 inhibitors or endocrine therapy or both. And uh, we also did RNA-seq, and we found that in the resistant organoids treated with CDK4-6 inhibitors, we saw an upregulation of E2F and G2M signatures relative to CDK4-6 inhibited, or CDK4-6 inhibitor treated sensitive organoids. Um, so all this together tells us um, that these organoid models are um, accurately representing um, CDK4-6 inhibitor resistant tumors. So together in co collaboration with Tempest, we did high throughput 3D drug screening using a fluorescence-based high content imaging approach. And uh, we tested seven of our genomically defined CDK4-6 inhibitor resistant organoids using four concentrations of about 60 clinically relevant inhibitors. And you can see that, again, um, these organoids are not very sensitive to CDK4-6 inhibitors. As proof of concept, we found that our one organoid that had cyclin E1 amplification was particularly sensitive to a CDK246 inhibitor and it was also particularly sensitive to a CHECK1-2 inhibitor. So finally, I'd like to go through some uh, remaining challenges that we have in the field. And clearly, what I've told you um, is not the full story. Um, there are still tumors where we don't know what's driving the resistance, and there is clearly still room to discover additional genomic and non-genomic mechanisms of CDK4-6 inhibitor resistance. Also, it can be difficult to disentangle the co contribution of uh, resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors versus resistance to endocrine therapy. And there are several alterations that can cause resistance to either one of them, such as um, FGFR1 or HER2 or the RAS pathway. Um, so this can be difficult to tease apart. Finally, um, I haven't really gone into the role of the tumor immune microenvironment, but clearly CDK4-6 inhibitors um, do alter the tumor microenvironment, and also the immune microenvironment um, plays a role in response to CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, I do think we need better laboratory models to study this, including uh, immune-competent animal models of ER-positive metastatic breast cancer, and um, some of this could also potentially be looked at in patient-derived organoids um, together uh, using co-cultures with immune cells.
And as we saw this morning, clinical trials of CDK4-6 inhibitors in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors are ongoing. So finally, I'd like to leave you with this example of a patient who had progressed on CDK4-6 inhibitor. And um, at the time of progression, ctDNA profiling was done. And um, you can see that in the ctDNA, there were um, a variety of different subclonal alterations in many of these um, driver, resistance driver alterations that I've just described. And um, the way I think about it is that um, this patient probably harbored multiple distinct metastatic subclones um, harboring these different alterations. And I think it would be really difficult to block all of these alterations together. Um, so I think we, it, we really need to interfere before it gets to this point. And one way to potentially do that would be uh, tracking progression using circulating tumor DNA profiling uh, to detect the outgrowth of resistant clones prior to bona fide clinical resistance. So to interfere at the time of low tumor burden rather than high tumor burden and uh, switch therapy or, or perhaps um, personalized therapy um, uh, by matching to whatever the resistance alteration um, is identified. Uh, another uh, potential future direction would be to target drug-tolerant persister cells uh, prior to the evolution of resistance and prior to the acquisition of a resistance mutation, um, assuming that the resistant mutations are not present um, at very low frequencies prior to treatment. So clearly, we do have our work cut out for us, um, but I do think it's an exciting time to be in the field, and I do think there is enormous opportunity um, to, to further um, define some of these therapeutic strategies, particularly match to certain biomarkers and to push those therapeutic strategies into the clinic for CDK4-6 inhibitor resistant breast cancers. So finally, I'd like to uh, thank everyone on the slide and particularly the patients, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hanker, for this excellent presentation. And now um, we can look at questions from the audience. Are there any questions? Yeah. That was fascinating. Thank you. You talked about multiple resistance mechanisms existing within the same patient. Were you able to look to see if there were multiple resistant mechanisms with each individual metastatic site? Uh, no, we weren't able to do that. All we had was the ctDNA report from the patient. We didn't have any tissue biopsies. Um, that would be interesting to look at, particularly um, some people are doing rapid autopsy programs um, to look at uh, different resistance alterations in, in all different um, metastatic sites. Uh, next question. Yeah, uh, I'm Dr. Manish from India. And my question is pertaining to what is ready for use tomorrow in the clinic. All these things may not be ready for use for a long time. And my question is also from the perspective of availability of generic drugs, which are very cheap. Palbocycle will be launched in India in January at the cost of $100 a month. There was a very interesting paper of the combination of letrozole with lenvatinib, even in patients who have been exposed to CDK4-6 inhibitors, because of crosstalk between the RET and the ER. What's your take on the combination of lenvatinib? Because even lenvatinib is available at a very cheap cost in India and is generic. Do you see any future of this combination? Um, I'm actually not aware of that paper, um, so I, I'm not sure about that. Um, in terms of some of these combinations and um, you know, when we're going to see them in the clinic, I, I think they're all at various different stages. Um, I did mention the HER2 inhibitors for HER2 mutant breast cancers are already in clinical trials. Um, as we, thought, we saw this morning, um, AKT inhibitors are doing, um, they might be doing well in clinical trials. So uh, for, for patients who have loss of P10 following resistance. Um, so it just depends on the particular alteration and how far advanced um, those drugs are. I have a question about your PDX models. Have you? Um, do you know if they're from 
resistant to different CDK4-6 inhibitors, or are they all from the same CDK6, CDK4-6 inhibitor? And I don't remember if you showed, if you determined that they remained resistant in, in culture, and, or if you found any reversible mechanisms of resistance. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, most of our biopsies were from patients treated with pavocyclib with either letrozole or fulvestrin. We do have a few treated with abemocyclib. I don't think we have any um, treated with ribocyclib. Um, almost all of them in vitro were cross-resistant to pavocyclib and abemocyclib, except for one model that was resistant to pavocyclib but sensitive to abemocyclib. And unfortunately, that one organoid grew super, super slowly, so we weren't able to determine why it was sensitive to abemocyclib and not pavocyclib. Thank you. All right, we will move on to the next presenter. Thank you. So our next presenter is Dr. Sarat Shantar Lapati. Dr. Shantar Lapati is an associate professor at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Uh, during his postdoc fellowship, he worked in the laboratory of Dr. Neil Rosen, where he studied uh, regulation of PI3 kinase and AKT signaling. In 2012, uh, Dr. Shantar Lopati joined the faculty at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and his work has focused on understanding the basis for resistance to, targeting, uh, to targeted therapies in breast cancer. The title of his talk today is Current Status of CDK2 Inhibitors in Preclinical Development. Thank you. All right, thanks for that, then. Uh, thank you to the organizers. So I will not spend as much time as, uh, as was spoken <laughs> on the disclosures. I'll just tell you that these are widely available at the ASCO website. Uh, so I think that with CDK2 inhibitors, we don't have this plethora of data from clinical use of CDK2 inhibitors. We don't have this plethora of uh, preclinical data even on the use of CDK2 inhibitors. And so the real question is that we can hope to try to address today is why. Why do we want to use a CDK2 inhibitor? Why is CDK2 a target? Um, and so I hope to persuade you that there are some really good reasons to think about CDK2 as a target and then get into what are some uh, emerging uh, programs in targeting CDK2. So why target CDK2? We've heard a little bit already, of course, on what CDK2 does in this uh, procession. Um, we know that ER and CDK4 uh, regulate uh, CDK2 via their transcriptional regulation of cyclin E, and that leads to further hyperphosphorylation of RB and G1S progression. So again, if we have ER inhibitors, if we have CDK4 inhibitors, why do we need to target downstream at the level of CDK2? Uh, and so that's, that's really what, what you know, I would say is the big question. What do we need to target this for if we've got all these uh, great drugs uh, upstream? And, and as was alluded to by Ariella, the, the, the real um, basis for the needing to target CDK2 came from resistance studies that identified uh, upregulation of C cyclin E uh, CDK2. And so this work from Violetta Serra and, and Nick Turner identified a model in which cyclin E was amplified, and that led to persistent phosphorylation of RB despite giving palbocyclib. Uh, Nick and, and colleagues on the PLOMA-3 trial went on to show that uh, high cyclin E expression uh, in that study was associated with a diminished response to the addition of palpocyclid to fulvestrin. So this high cyclin E state, however it arose, uh, is associated with reduced response to uh, a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And more recently, there has been data identifying specific alterations that might lead to that high cyclin E state. So uh, we don't see huge numbers of cyclin E amplified tumors that might be constitutively high in cyclin E, uh, but we are seeing genetic alterations that might impinge on cyclin E. And these could come by a variety of mechanisms. They could come by just reactivating CDK4-6, which of course is going to drive cyclin E transcription, uh, or they could come from other mechanisms. Uh, this work from uh, Dan Jurek and colleagues at MGH identified P10 loss as again, associated with resistance to the 4-6 inhibitors and associated with high cyclin E and uh, a, an early rebound in RB phosphorylation. And there are other alterations. This is work from Scott Lowe's group in 
actually in lung cancer, but again, identifying that uh, P27 and its phosphorylation may be in yet another way of regulating CDK2 cyclin E, leading to its persistent activity and that leading to uh, lack of response to some of these upstream uh, targeted approaches. So all of these would point to a high cyclin E state leading to RB phosphorylation bypassing in effect the, of the 4-6 inhibitor. What I want to spend the bulk of the time is on some new work that we've been doing in a lab, it's unpublished, looking at a different uh, reason why it might be useful to target CDK2. Uh, and so it'll take me a little while to get there, but hopefully um, uh, some new data that will be of interest. So again, a lot of our work and, and others' work has been on that initial state of resistance. You get the drug, three months later, there's progression on the 4-6 inhibitor. What are the genetic alterations associated with that? RB loss, uh, FGFR, FAT1, what are things that lead to insensitivity to the drug? But we know that a lot of our patients, they respond for a time and then progress. They're on it for a year. They're on it for two years and then progress. And that's distinguished from the group of patients who are on from five years and six years. So what is the difference between that middle tertile of patients and the latter one that's on for a long time? And so that's the way that uh, we were starting to look at this. I'm uh, colleagues, uh, Petr Mursavi and Anton Safanov, together with a postdoc in my lab, Ray Kudo, looked at it in this way. And th in this volcano plot, what we find are the alterations that are enriched or not enriched, I should say, in the patients who do really well are here. P53, as well as PPM1D and MDM2, but overwhelmingly P53, and these two other genes which are direct regulators of P53. So it would seem that the P53 pathway is playing a role in the lack of durable response to 4-6 inhibitors, uh, or at least is associated based on these data. And so Ray went on to, to study this in the lab. Of course, generating um, P53 knockout and MDM2 overexpressing models. Uh, and shown here is the initial response to the CDK4-6 inhibitor. So if you initially give the drug, you dephosphorylate RB. With a persistent or intrinsically resistant model, you do not. And with the P53s and MDM2, you do. You get the same downregulation of RB phosphorylation. And as a result, you get the same level of block in G1 that you do with parental cells. So they are initially responding to the drug. But when we grow them for a while, the story changes. When we grow them over the long term, we see the P53s and the MDM2s grow out in these uh, growth assays, as well as in colony formation assays. Even when we wash out the drug, the parental cells are um, persistently inhibited, uh, but not the P53s and the MDM2s. We looked at uh, re-adding back wild type P53. What does that do to this effect? And if you add back wild type P53, you restore their sensitivity uh, and leave them long-term uh, inhibited, but not if you add back mutant P53s, like these common mutants in P53 that we often see in our breast cancer patients. So there seemed to be this disconnect between short-term and long-term. Um, we went on to look at additional long-term phenotypes, specifically, when we treat ER-positive breast cancer cells with CDK4 inhibitors, we do see uh, phenotypes of senescence associated with that. And you can see that here. This senescence-associated beta-gal is observed in, treat in cells treated long-term with CDK4 inhibitors. This is also lost in P53 and MDM2 mutant cells. Uh, and you can see that quantitated here. Additionally, the chromatin changes that are associated with these senescence phenotypes uh, are assayed here using focus formation for HP1 gamma. And again, MCF7 parental cells, you know, generate these focus formations, but you lose it in the P53s and the MDM2s, just like you do in the intrinsic resistant models. So we're seeing this disconnect between the short-term effect of the CDK4 inhibitors and the long-term effects of them, at least in these uh, cell culture models. So to study that, we wanted to do a time course. We wanted to follow cells over time and see what happened. Uh, and so to do that, we use this uh, fluorescence-based assay that tracks cells when they're in G1 versus when they're moving into S and G2 and follow them in time course after inhibition and then release from drug. And so you can see the parental cells here in red are just staying in G1. They're not moving out of it. You're not seeing a lot of uh, yellow and green cells emerge. By contrast, with the P53 knockouts, uh, 
they, you already start to see within a short time after release that they start to uh, move back into the cell cycle. So they were arrested, but then they moved back into the cell cycle. And that's depicted in this, uh, uh, the, the, these time-lapse photographs of this. All right, so that really brought to mind the fact that the cells were arrested, but they were re-entering the cell cycle. And that process of re-entry of the cell cycle is controlled uh, by a conserved pathway, the dream complex, uh, that uh, is controlled in part by a pocket protein, just like RB, but in this case, P130. And that P130 is regulated by phosphorylation, just like RB, and it is phosphorylated uh, in part by CDK2. So finally, we came back to CDK2. Uh, and what you can see here is that, unlike the parental cells, the P53 cells that are knocked out for P53 have persistent P130 phosphorylation in the presence of the 4-6 inhibitor. So what controls CDK2 in this context? Uh, it is, of course, regulated by tumor suppressors like P21 and P27, but critically, P21 is regulated by P53. And so that really provided the link for us to, to say we should add back P21 here and see if it restores the response. And you can see that here using an inducible uh, P21 construct, we're able to restore that inhibition of P130 phosphorylation. And as a consequence of that, we do see that the long-term phenotypes are observed when we restore P21, we restore the capacity for generating senescence phenotypes, we restore the long-term growth inhibition uh, that you see with the parental cells. So then that told us we could perhaps have a pharmacologic approach, and that brings us to CDK2 inhibitors. And so we utilized uh, available CDK2 inhibitors in vitro and just asked if CDK246 inhibition or com combination of 2 plus 46 inhibition could do the same thing, could inhibit P130 phosphorylation in the P53 mutant context. And indeed, as you see here, uh, they are capable of doing so. Um, and that, again, translates to these long-term phenotypes being achieved like senescence. And so shown here is something of a model that we're putting together. And what I think it emphasizes to us is that, that CDK2 has more than just that initial role in driving cells uh, um, into G1S through that phosphor hyperphosphorylation of RB, but it maintains cells. It prevents them from going in back into this... Um, so, or sorry, they, it, it, it blocks the process of being of cell cycle reentry. And so uh, having a drug that inhibits it could allow cells to be maintained uh, by that dream complex and maintained uh, in an arrested state. Whether the additional phenotypes of senescence uh, are necessary or useful for that anti-tumor effect, uh, that's still to be studied. And there's a lot of controversy, as many of you know, on the value of that senescence, whether it's tumor suppressive or tumor promoting. Uh, but we do think that the prevention of that reentry uh, may be quite important to the effect of CDK2. All right, so that's great. Can we do it? Can we actually target CDK2 uh, or is that gonna be super toxic um, because it's downstream and fundamental? Well, we've known for a long time that knocking out CDK2 is uh, not detrimental to uh, murine development and uh, these knockout mice grow just fine. Uh, and so that actually promoted some of the drug development, early drug development programs trying to target CDK2. Challenge there was these weren't just CDK2 inhibitors. They were CDK1 inhibitors. They were CDK9 inhibitors. They, they targeted many different CDKs. And so as a result, we don't, weren't really sure if the toxicities that were accrued from these early programs were due to CDK2 or due to something else. Fortunately, there's been a lot of structural studies and pharmacologic um, studies to try to better target CDK2, that there are different pockets in CDK2 and different strategies for targeting CDK2. And uh, I just highlight one here um, from Stacey Blaine's group that's used a peptide approach to target uh, the P27 uh, phosphorylation. And by blocking that phosphorylation, you could lock P27 CDK2 into an inactive state, and that worked in this model where you see um, progression on a CDK4 inhibitor, but uh, stability on the um, uh, P27 approach. But of course, there are direct inhibitors of CDK2 that are also in development, and most notably, uh, th these uh, two publications from Pfizer on their 
uh, CDK246 inhibitor. In this case, they, they took their existing platform of CDK4, of palbocyclib, and added uh, moieties that allowed inhibition of CDK2. And you can see the effect here was to inhibit uh, palbocyclib resistant models in vivo. That uh, program has been translated into the clinic, and patients have been treated with CDK246 inhibitors. Uh, and this is just an early look presented last year uh, in a poster here at San Antonio, uh, seeing uh, activity in some patients who had prior 46 inhibitors. There have been um, toxicities such as myelosuppression, and the uh, modulation of dose and schedule has been used to try to deal with that. I don't want to spend a great deal of time because we don't have a lot of data from this study to really dig into the activity of CDK2, uh, the genetics of which tumors responded or didn't. Uh, I would just say that there are many different programs that are emerging that are looking at targeting either CDK2 alone or CDK246 uh, as a composite, and then taking that and either combining it with antiestrogens or combining it with 4-6 inhibitors. Uh, and, and so I what I hope that uh, we can sort of glean from all this is that there are some really good rationales uh, as to why we might want to target CDK2 in addition to CDK4-6, um, and that there may be some very specific context where this could be particularly useful, and we ought to have our eyes uh, towards those as we move into the clinic. Uh, and while early generation drugs may have suffered, suffered from promiscuity, I think there's a lot of promise in the new uh, approaches that are coming. So with that, I will uh, close on time, I think, and just want to highlight again the work that was from my lab from Ray Kudo, um, as well as my many collaborators, uh, our patients and funders for their support. <clears throat> Hi, Sarat. So great talk. So uh, the quick look at the toxicity profiles from the CDK246 inhibitor suggested uh, a pretty, quite severe toxicity, uh, myelosuppression. Uh, I think uh, it looked to me at first glance more severe than you would see with, with palbo cyclip or ribociclip. So uh, why is that? I mean, uh, does that suggest that Inhibiting all three targets may not be doable. Uh, should we, would blocking CDK2 be equivalent or better than blocking CDK4-6? Seems to be you're blocking downstream that G1-2S and also blocking that S phase transition maybe. So would that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's early days to, to really make the comparison and, and there are sort of notions of should we target CDK2 and CDK4 mainly because 6 is only upregulated later. Um, there are notions that you just target ER and they have a tumor specific way of targeting 4 6, but then get this backup pathway with CDK2. Um, a lot of this is speculation right now, though, and without a lot of data. But I agree with you that uh, if you do pound 2, 4, and 6 really, really hard, that's going to affect the hematopoietic um, progenitors, I mean, cells, and, and so you're going to have an issue there, yeah. Any data on CDK2 inhibition alone, would that be better or more tolerated? I know that it's out there, but I don't think it's been disclosed very much. <laughs> so. Thank you. All right. So our next speaker is Professor Charles Coombs from the Department of Cancer Medicine at Imperial College London. Uh, Professor Coombs is a physician scientist and has done remarkable work in drug discovery and development in breast cancer. Among other of his work, he had, uh, he had an instrumental role in the development of aromatase inhibitors. He's also been leading the development of CDK7 inhibitors in breast cancer. The title of his talk is Inhibiting Transcriptional CDKs in Breast Cancer. Well, thank, you. thank you very much for inviting me to talk. I'd like to thank uh, Carlos and Dr. Kaklamani for inviting me. So, okay, <clears throat> maybe we could just have the first slide. Okay, these are my uh, disclosures. All right, so you'll all know that transcription <clears throat> is the process leading to the expression of ribonucleic acids from the DNA template. And when I was at medical school, this was the sort of figure that we would see in our textbooks. 
Uh, but since then, it's got a little bit more complicated. There are more than 294 oncogenic transcription factors. And I became interested in this subject many years ago, obviously with the uh, interest in the Eastern receptor. Okay, so this is a diagram, a simplified diagram of what we know about the process of uh, transcription. And what I'd like you to focus on is, the, for me, the most interesting point is this uh, C-terminal tail of RNA polymerase two. RNA polymerase is the machinery that moves through the gene body and as it moves through, you'll see that the phosphorylation sites in the C-terminal tail are increasing. There are, in fact, this is a great simplification because there are, in fact, 52 heptad repeats in the C-terminal tail. And uh, the phosphorylation cascade enables the tail to be a multi-protein uh, kind of uh, landing strip uh, as the uh, gene is being uh, uh, moved across by RNA polymerase II. So the reason I would like you to focus on that is that these phosphorylation events are all uh, regulated by different kinases, and it's these kinases that I'm going to be talking to you about this afternoon. So just to start with CDK8, CDK8 and the mediator complex is I'm afraid more complicated than any of the other kinases in this picture. And there are pro and uh, repressive uh, uh, qualities to CDK8. There are CDK8 inhibitors. Um, they are showing some in, in different models show good effects and others show really bad effects. So I'm not gonna talk about CDK8. I don't have the time. Uh, but CDK7 is really interesting because this kinase starts the process, it initiates, you can see by phosphorylating the tail here, and in so doing, it uh, displaces the pre-initiation complex and also starts the process and regulates initially pausing before you get CDK9 coming in, which itself is activated by CDK7, which then causes the process of release and elongation. So the RNA polymerase machinery starts moving down the DNA. Now, that much we know, but later on, I'm afraid, things get a little bit more uh, complicated because the process of termination is still hotly debated. All that we can say is that there's a combination of 12 and 13 uh, regulate both serine 2 and serine 5, in contrast to C CDK7, which is just causing serine 5 phosphorylation, and CDK9, which just causes serine 2. So these two kinases, 12 and 13, kind of work somehow. They are essential to uh, transcription, but they also regulate the process of termination in uh, ways which are not yet fully understood. Okay, so despite this uncertainty, there are transcriptional CDKs in development. And I'm going to focus mainly on seven and nine, and then I'll tell you something about, about 12 and 13 and mention at the end 11 and 20. Okay, so CDK7 was of interest to us back in, uh, I guess, 1997. It was only discovered in 1990, but Simak Ali had been working with uh, Pierre Chambon and uh, found that serine uh, 118 in the Eastern receptor was a very important site for phosphorylation. And uh, when he moved to my laboratory, he discovered that CDK7 was the main kinase responsible for this event. And in so doing, this phosphorylation increased sensitivity to estrogen. So if you've got CDK7 in the mix, uh, tamoxifen becomes an agonist, and um, low levels of estrogen, such as seen in aromatase inhibitor-treated patients, become agonistic in the presence of CDK7. So for me, as a clinician, this seemed an obvious target for reversing resistance to endocrine therapy. So as we 
became more interested in it. Again, it became more complicated because CDK7 not only phosphorylates this uh, serine 5 residues on polymerase 2, it also phosphorylates the estrogen receptor and also mediator. And in addition to which, it activates cell cycle by phosphorylating CDK1, 2, and CDK4 and 6. So this is a multi-active initiator and uh, of, of both cell cycle and transcription. It seems to um, kind of um, coordinate this process together. So to cut a long story short, we spent, uh, I think, 12, 13 years developing inhibitors at Imperial College. Um, and uh, we came up after about 1,400 compounds with uh, CT7001, semurociclib. This is um, an oral compound, once daily, small molecule, ATP competitive, selective inhibitor. Uh, we published it uh, several years ago. It is synergistic with endocrine therapy. So, for example, this is MCF7 cells. The light, this is the um, uh, growth here. The light green is the um, uh, tamoxifen alone and Fazlodex alone. And when you add some uracyclib, um, it, you get a much better effect. And similarly with the xenograft, I've only shown one here, the MCF7 xenograft here. The light green is the combination uh, compared with vehicle and blue and uh, th this is the endocrine therapy alone. Oh, you've got something happening. Oh. Okay, so um, Samura, it turns out that uh, Samurociclib also um, uh, d displaces polymerase two, and ChIP-seq experiments that Simax group did showed that um, both at the hexin one gene and also the cyclin D1 gene, you can see the recruitment of RNA polymerase to is in a, is depressed in a dose-dependent fashion here in both these genes. And when we looked at uh, using RNA-seq, the GSEA hallmark showed G2M checkpoint with the top um, uh, genes inhibited followed by mitotic spindles and E2F target. So um, there are several CDK inhibitors now out there. Um, uh, most are non-covalent inhibitors. There are two covalent inhibitors now. Um, Cyros uh, SY5609 uh, is in development. Uh, and is, there are studies in a colon, pancreatic, cancer. And uh, semurociclib is the one I mentioned. Uh, Carrick has been developing this with us, and it's in use in breast cancer. Now, the, we carried out the, the phase one study. I don't have time to go into that here, but um, one of the in vitro studies we did was uh, looking at palbo-resistant breast cancer cells in both MCF7 and T47D using both... Uh, uh, we, we generated some palbo-resistant cells, as you can see here, and then we used the THZ1, which is a, another very potent inhibitor of CDK7, and our inhibitor. And you can see that both the resistant and the um, wild type are sensitive um, to, um, to uh, CDK7 inhibition. And so that then informed the study which I presented last year, so I'm not going to go over this, but just for those of you who may not have seen this, um, this is a sort of summary. We treated, um, uh, I guess, 36 patients, uh, ER positive patients who become resistant to CDK4-6 inhibition, uh, and we gave them a combination of semurociclib and fulvestrand. And uh, you'll, you'll know that the kind of du duration of fulvestrand alone in this situation shown by the Solar and Veronica studies, for example, is, is very short, sometimes around three months. But you can see many patients uh, either responded to treatment and went on for more than a year. Um, and we found that uh, wild type P53, we looked at P53 in plasma, and mutant P53 patients shown by this kind of uh, orange hatch bar didn't seem to do very well 
Um, and, and that was predicted by the in, in vitro studies. So this drug is now um, being fast-tracked by the FDA and is being partnered with CERDs in, in uh, several countries, I think, at the moment. Okay, so uh, just uh, a, a run through of CDK9. There are now more than 100 CDK9 inhibitors uh, in the literature. Um, in general, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail, they are associated with neutropenia, and therefore challenging to combine. Uh, CDK7 inhibitors, I forgot to say, uh, do not cause neutropenia. They have uh, no, uh, we've seen a couple of uh, cases of thrombocytopenia or mild, which necessitated discontinuation, but other than that, we haven't seen hematological toxicity. But CDK9 inhibition is different. Um, dosing, therefore, their shod schedules are often intermittent and often need to be given intravenously, but I know that oral compounds are in development. And in fact, AZD4573 is a highly selective inhibitor. You'll see, if you look down here, the, the serine 2 phosphorylation, which is characteristic of CDK9 as opposed to serine 5 phosphorylation, which is characteristic of CDK7, you'll see the difference in terms of IC50, 0 0.014 to 1.1. 1, 1. So it's a highly selective uh, CDK9 inhibitor, um, and also by this kinome scan um, that looks at uh, selectivity. The other is the Bayer compound, VIP152. Uh, this has just been published this year. Um, you will see that uh, in addition to hematologic uh, cancers, they have got some responses here in solid tumors. And there are some patients who have gone for, um, uh, uh, you know, six, six, nine months on this drug. So I think this is going to be very interesting going forward. All right, well, I just want to mention um, CDK12. I mentioned that this is uh, this has sequence homology with CDK13. It, I mentioned that the biology of CDK12 isn't quite as well worked out as CDK7. Uh, and just to give you a feel for the properties of CDK12, it not only um, regulates transcriptional elongation, the way I've said, but it has a major role in splicing. So as the RNA gets made, it needs to be um, dealt with by the spliceosome, and so CDK12 actually regulates RNA stability. It's not known exactly how this happens, unlike CDK11, which I'll show you in a moment, but essentially this results in an upregulation of DNA repair proteins. And this is going to be important, I think, going forward. There are now selective CDK12-13 inhibitors, and the two that I'm showing here are the CARIC compounds, um, which have been used in uh, ovarian cancer, uh, BRCA ovarian cancer, and shown that with a PARP inhibitor, niraparib, you do get a synergy um, in these ovarian cancer models. And the um, CYROS pharmaceutical compound which was just presented this year, was used in MDA uh, in, in these BRCA uh, deficient cells and also in um, triple negative, and as you can see, shows good effect as well. Uh, and so the uh, CARIC compound turns out it's also an oral cyclin degrader, apparently. Um, it, you can see the levels of cyclin uh, K are markedly diminished. It's got good pharmacokinetics, can be given orally, and has uh, very little in the way of side effects, uh, judged by the animal model. So that's the, the progress of several. I'm not going to go over them. They're both non-covalent and covalent. There are several companies making these at the moment. So I mentioned just finally CDK11, um, just a paper, a very important paper uh, a couple of months ago in Nature showed that it uh, interacts, this uh, SF3B1, which is this green key-like structure here, needs to be phosphorylated uh, by CDK11 in order to become 
part of the spliceosome complex. And if you block this phosphorylation, you get a defective splicing. So that's going to be a very important. Uh, this is using a, a, actually quite an old compound, OTS594, which is, uh, wasn't known to inhibit uh, CDK7. And then finally, CDK20, uh, it's a CAC. Um, it, like, um, uh, CD, C, uh, like uh, CDK7. Uh, it's going to be interesting, I think. Expressed in many cancers, inhibitors enhance immune checkpoint blockade, uh, activate CDK2, uh, and I think very little work's been done on this yet, but I think it's going to be important. So finally, I really want to thank Asimak Ali, who's been uh, really my uh, co-worker for more than 25 years now. Uh, Tony Barrett's team and Matt Fuchter made the drug that I talked to you about, funded by Cancer Research UK. And Matt Krebs led the phase one study. And Carrick have been great, great company. Um, Stuart is here uh, today. And of course, all the patients that took part in our phase one and phase two studies I'd like to thank. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Coombs. Unfortunately, we will not have time for questions. Um, this concludes our session. Thank you all for participating, and you are welcome to join the next session or visit the exhibits. <laughs>